a quote from Albert Einstein, the important thing is to never stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. The most beautiful thing that we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of true art and science. And I just, I, I love starting out with that, especially when I do schools, because um, I think the basis of science and arts and everything else is to always continue to ask questions because we don't learn by being stagnant. So um, that's me. Uh, it's not some random child I put in my PowerPoint. That's me um, in my first microscope. That man right there was my grandfather. Um, he since passed a long time ago, but he was the first person to believe in me whenever I said that I wanted to, um, well, I wanted to be a herpetologist. So I used to bring home snakes and turtles and frogs and stuff. My mom was not a giant fan, but you know, she's a therapist, so she thought it was something different. But this, uh, but then she thought it was a phase, it's not. Um, and now I have a six-year-old and I'm paying for that. So, um, but yeah, that was uh, my first microscope and I was really happy and my mom was not happy that I got that because the whole purpose of that is you're supposed to put bugs in slides. And so we had bugs in our house for about 10 years. That's fine. Um, like she said, I went to Missouri Western. Um, that's me, I was on MTV's True Life as a platinum blonde, 2007, long time ago, please don't watch it. Um, that's me as a nurse, I really was one. Um, that's me and Charlene Harris. I did some work for the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, she wrote True Blood. Do any of you know that? Yeah, I met her and wasn't really, my parents kind of were uh, uh, super religious and I didn't really get to watch a lot of anything until I was out and in college. And even then I still had some kind of, I mean, I feel like this room understands that, had some kind of hangups about it. So I really didn't know anything about that. I met her and then I went through it and I'm like, she's a genius. Uh, that's an antidote. I do that a lot, so you just hold on tight. Um, that's me. Um, I won Miss Midwest, like she said, but I was the first curvy girl to ever win that. Um, and that's really kind of why I wanted to do it, was just to prove that I could. Um, you know, I have endometriosis, and I'm a big uh, proponent for that organization, the awareness of that organization, and it's really caused me a lot of problems with my body and self-esteem and um, also just being a woman in STEM and people telling you you can't do anything uh, really kind of messes with you. Um, oh, I work for Blockbuster. This room knows what Blockbuster is. When I do that in elementary schools, they have absolutely no idea what that is. They're like, is it a grocery store? Like, yeah, sure. Um, I opened up a Scooters. I did that for three years. Um, I worked at Abercrombie, also thankfully a ghost in our past. Um, I, w I worked at a pork processing plant up in St. Joseph. Didn't last very long because I love pigs. Um, and so I did all these things. And my purpose for telling you that is my journey is very random and long to lead me to this point. But it's really great because when you work with the public to have knowledge of all different kinds of fields and things, I can try to relate to a lot of people. Um, so now this is what I do. I go speak at schools, usually in front of a lot of pizza like that. Um, and my daughter is asleep right there because I'm boring. And uh, this is me on the news. You can catch me on Fox or KCTV5 once or twice a week um, if you want. And if you go to Casey's NASA Lady, I usually post all my appearances on there so you can see it. But I'm free to speak at any schools. If any of you work for schools or organizations, it's free to you and I love doing it. So please have me. And there we go. All right, so then how I got into astronomy and stuff was, these are the first pictures I ever took of Saturn, and that's Jupiter and its moons. And I don't know if any of you have looked through a telescope before, but it really is life-changing. I see a bunch of heads shaking. It's life-changing because you see something that's so big outside yourself, something that exists completely independent to all life on Earth, and it just changes your perspective on everything. So um, I'm just really proud of that, and just being able to sit in a living room and see Saturn, something that at that point was just kind of a concept, because you know we can't see it every day, so it's just kind of this idea, um, changed my life, and I said I have to do that. Um, this is a mobile planetarium. I used to work out of one of those. I want to build one, so if any of you has like 70 grand, let me know. Um, but I would love to do that, take it to schools and stuff. Um, that's Ed Stone. 
I see some people know who he is. Um, he is, he ran the Voyager program. He's like NASA legend, amazing, kiss his feet type of person. Um, but I go to JPL once or twice a year to kind of catch up on what we're doing. Um, and that's the clean room. I got to uh, mess with some Mars rovers. It's pretty neat. And I got to design a tube that's going on the Mars 2020 rover. It has my name on it. It's going, I'm just telling you all this so you know I'm legit. Like, that's really the only reason so you guys think I'm cool. Um, but that's a big part of what I do. So here today I'm going to talk about Artemis, which Artemis is actually like a really big project and idea. So I'm just going to touch lightly on it so you guys kind of know uh, what it is. And maybe you guys will have me back to talk about some other stuff too. Um, that's our graphic from our graphic design team that I, I have to put in here. But it's cute. Um, Artemis, the whole idea of Artemis is basically for us to return back to the moon. Um, the last time, or the first time we went to the moon was 1969. Um, it's been a while since we've been there. So um, to go back, the goal is by 2024 or so. Um, but also, the bigger goal is to have the first woman on the moon. And hopefully more than one. So <laughs> I, like a, I like an applause line. So if you want to do that at like any random interval, that's fine. And we just had the first female spacewalk. Um, Jessica Meir, who I work with a lot, um, did that. And uh, I just spoke to her the other day and I was like, I could never, I get that question a lot. If I want to go to space, absolutely not. No, thank you. I have a six year old, I'm not doing any of that. I'm staying right here. So this is just a little about our moon and that font's really small. I told you, my PowerPoint. But this is just a little bit about our moon. There's no atmosphere on it. Um, Gravity is about one fifth of Earth. So that's about how much less you weigh there, um, which is why the spacesuits are so heavy because they have to keep you from, you know, floating. Um, it orbits the Earth every 27.3 days and it takes us about three days to get there on average. New technology could make that a little shorter. Here's the picture, the first lunar landing. All right, and Artemis, what, who or what is Artemis? Where did they get the name? Well, you all are about to sigh. Artemis was Apollo's twin sister. And so, there's not enough sighing. And so, she is the Greek goddess of the moon. And as you know, Apollo was the mission, uh, the, the several missions that ended up leading us to the moon, Artemis being the twin sister. So that's kind of the idea. NASA is very cute like that. Um, this is just our official graphic that I have to put in here talking about what Artemis is, but I already touched it, so we're going to keep going. And how we're getting there. So this is cool. So, so, so. This is, people always ask me, why are we doing any of this stuff? What's the point? It's a lot of money. We got problems here. We really have to fix. But if you look at our history with space travel, all the things that we have invented that have improved humankind by leaps and bounds, like we're talking microchips. All of you have cell phones. If you say you don't, you're lying. Um, we're talking about cordless tools, memory foam, which you think of as a luxury item, but memory foam helps a lot of people who uh, have different kinds of disabilities and things. And it insulates things. We've, we've got fire retardant insulator stuff that just has really improved society as a whole. So that's why we go. Um, but also just there, you cannot put a price on innovation and excitement and having a goal that we all kind of unite around ourselves, kind of talking about earlier how rare it is to have us all kind of want something as a society, right? Um, so how we're getting there, we're going to develop a new SLS, which is just a space, a space launch system. This is an artist rendering um, that a friend of mine helped make, so I asked if I could borrow it. Um, and they're also developing a new uh, capsule named Orion, which is a huge uh, mission that is independent of all of this. And that's going to take us up there. Um, and them developing that is a whole different conversation talk and how it works is great. Um, I included all of these because I just really like them. Uh, these are all the blueprints of all the things that don't yet exist, but that's the official blueprint. Um, and it, I just like to kind of show it on one big slide because I think it's so cool to look at human innovation as a whole and realize that just this one mission, we're going to develop all this new technology. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Um, and this is the new spacesuit concept, which I think is really cool. And I have some of these blueprints tattooed on me. So I think I'm a little more attached to them than most people are. Um, 
my dad hates it, so dad, don't listen to any of that. Um, and so when are we going to go? Um, we've got Artemis 1, 2, and 3, just like what we had with Apollo. The first mission is kind of getting us out the door, seeing what we learn. Hopefully we don't, uh, we might fail, but we learn more from failure than we do success, so that's okay. Um, but we're going to launch the SLS with Orion with no astronauts, and then they're going to go and orbit the moon for the second mission, and then the third, we're going to land on the moon, and we're taking a woman. Did I mention that? Okay. Okay. Um, and that's 2024, which in NASA language usually means 2030. So, you know. Listen, I was, I've been a part, I was part of the Parker Solar Probe, which was a mission that we sent a probe to the sun, and that was three and a half years delayed, and James Webb, if any of you know what that is, that's going to replace Hubble, and we're years beyond what we said that was going to happen, but, you know, you don't want to do something that's unsafe. Um, so, oh, goodness, see, I told you. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look for water on the moon, and it's not water like you see in a cup, like liquid water. It is a type of, every time I explain this, it's kind of odd. It is a microscopic kind of water where it is chemically, technically water, but it doesn't look like water. So, but the goal is to find that and make it so it can be consumable. Um, other than that, also, we have to figure out how to grow plants on the moon. Um, a lot of it, we're working on fuel and sustainability, getting there and back really quickly. Um, the more that we do that, the easier it's going to be to go to Mars, which is obviously kind of the ultimate uh, goal. Um, and then we have so many new um, experiments and things that they're going to send up there. I know teams from every major university are fighting to get their experiments done on the moon and the space station. Um, a lot from this area, actually. So um, it's pretty neat. Um, this is just a picture from 1968, Bill Anders from Apollo 8 when he was orbiting the moon. He took this picture. This is the first picture ever taken of the Earth from anywhere else, which sounds like a really simple thing, but if you think about it, it's not. This is the first time a human saw the Earth in its entirety, period, ever. Um, and I just, I don't know. Can you imagine looking out a window and seeing that? Everything you know, everything that exists, everything, everything, just in one little terrifying. But cool, but no thank you, again. Um, okay, let's see, we've got six, is this six minutes till the Q&A? Okay, cool. I like you guys, this is the first time I've ever spoken where they have a countdown clock, because as you can see, I'm kind of everywhere, so that's nice. So I put this in here, I just wanted to talk maybe about other moons and stuff in the solar system, if we had time, because, you know, why not? Okay, so we've got Jupiter, it's got 79 moons. This is a picture we just took. That's up on top of Jupiter is an aurora borealis, just like you would see in Iceland um, or Alaska or any other place. Um, yeah, but we, but we caught, yeah, and it's huge. I mean, that's several times the Earth size, so. Um, and it's got 79 moons as of two weeks ago, so maybe 80 by now. Um, we find new ones all the time, so, um, and of course, I'll tell you, 80% of those moons were found by amateur astronomers. People that don't get paid, they just kind of do it for fun. Um, a lot of stars and galaxies are discovered that way too, about 95% of asteroids. So that's why I do what I do, because I really think, um, especially when you hear about close calls of things hitting the Earth, it's really important that we uh, allow people to do that. Um, this is Europa. It's one of the moons of Jupiter. These little cracks are caused from water and geysers and ice and frozen plates that move around. Um, that, they think that there may be life there. I like to imagine that it's not like microscopic life, but it's like giant alien whale things with like foreheads and stuff. And they can only survive on nitrogen or something crazy, but um, you know. Um, that's Io. It is the most geologically active object in our solar system. Um, it has 400 volcanoes. This thing right here is a volcano in itself. Um, not a great place to live. You would suffocate on methane in like two seconds. So, um, but it's really cool looking. And my love, this is Saturn. This is from Cassini, rest in peace, pour one out. Um, but this was one of the first pictures we took of Saturn. It doesn't even look real. Like, I, I, I know it's real intellectually, but I still don't think it's real. 
Um, it's got 62, actually I think it has 67 now, moons. Um, this is Titan, that's from Saturn. It's kind of pixelated, it's a bunch of pictures all put in one, which is kind of a trend with a lot of uh, moons and things, because we didn't, up until a certain point, we don't really have a lot of spacecraft, spacecrafts going out there to specifically check on moons. Um, but now, we do. Um, this is likely an early Earth. So, so, if we go there and we check all this stuff out and we run some tests, we could learn about all kinds of things about uh, where the Earth came from, uh, biologically, geologically, all of that. It's kind of like an old picture, but we can like play on it and stuff. So um, that's pretty neat. Um, this is Enceladus. These are ice geysers coming off of Enceladus. Uh, I believe New Horizons took that on its way to Pluto. Um, and there's Enceladus. I just think that's so beautiful. There's Mimas. What does this look like? Think I, I'm in the right room for the for this. So, I, and you know what though, I get middle schools get it every time, which makes me really happy, because it, it makes me really happy because you really don't know, you don't know. Um, yes, it looks like the Death Star. Um, it's basically just a giant rock that gets impaled constantly, and there's nothing. It's like Mercury. It's like it's great. It exists, but it's no moon. No, no women will go there because there's no point. Um, <laughs> um, we do everything intentionally 80% of the time. Um, there's Neptune. It has 14 known moons. Um, it's actually my favorite planet to look at because I just think it's so serene and pretty even though it's actually mass chaos. Um, there's Uranus. Um, has 27 moons. Uranus also really pretty. The rings are not in there. They're actually really hard to photograph. They're in a lot of like conceptual art and stuff, but they're actually really hard of oh, telescope to get. Oh, okay. And then this is just a really cool picture that shows our innovation. Okay. This is when I was in college. So 06 to 08 ish. That's a picture that we had of Pluto. And we're like, this is the best it's ever going to get. And then we send new horizons a few years ago and we get this. Yes, yeah, so that's Pluto. No, it's not a planet. You can fight me after. I don't care. Um, and then this is a close-up picture of the surface of Pluto, which if you grew up in my generation or before, it seems completely surreal that we could even do that. But it's, again, it's just a great uh, demonstration of our innovation. That's the surface of Pluto. Yeah. Yeah. Because we didn't even really know that Pluto existed in itself until 04, 05-ish. Um, this is the first picture of Hubble that I've ever taken. I know we're bouncing all over the place, but this is just how my brain works. Um, I included this because Hubble, to me, is one of the best things that humankind has ever done, especially in aeronautics. Um, you know, when they launched it, it was broken. It had a problem with its mirrors and a piece of hardware on it. They went up, they fixed it. They didn't know if it was going to work. They turn it on, and this is the first thing they see. And the thing is, we didn't know that there were this many galaxies. These are not stars. These are galaxies. So in this picture, you're looking at at least trillions of stars. And to know that the only star that we see kind of in our face is the sun, but yet there's trillions of those. So what lies out there? You know, what are we looking at? Are we looking at whole civilizations that have been born and since gone? I don't, I don't know. Or super intelligent uh, alien life outside of us that, you know, thinks quantum mechanics is like Neanderthalic math. I don't know. It's true. That's what I like to think about. You know, it kind of unlocks your brain. So I'm not a huge sci-fi fan, sorry, but I like that it kind of takes science and kicks it up a notch for creativity, you know? So I always include that. It's kind of mind-blowing. And if you ever get bored, just sit and look at the stream from Hubble. Different organizations uh, apply to take pictures with it. And we're about to decommission it completely for James Webb, so, which that'll be a whole new, whole new thing. James Webb's going to be out further with better technology by, it's going to make Hubble look like a portable calculator in comparison. So um, that's going to be crazy. So, um, and then this is yet another picture from Hubble. Yeah, we're great. This is a nebula. Um, and when we take pictures like this, we use different kind of wavelengths. So I really suggest that you go, you look up the Pillars of Creation or Horsehead Nebula. 
but look at it and say in different wavelengths. It sounds kind of nerdy and boring, but it's not. You're going to see this in a completely different way. Is that the end of it? Okay, good. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for having me. I know I'm kind of like over the place. This is new for me. This kind of organization is new for me, but um, I'm really happy. This is actually like the first event that I'm doing that people I know can come to. We, we like people. Yeah. You should bring them. Well, you All know, I think, yeah. I think you, you say that it meets on an afternoon or on a Sunday, and then some people, especially people that I work with, have no idea, like, if it's what it, what it is. But, you know, I think having open doors and having that attitude, especially when it comes to science, because we should not be gatekeeping education. Period. So, <laughs> so... Um, Education, you know, education is the ultimate equalizer. Ultimate equalizer. It can take kids or adults from any situation, and you introduce any kind of education, and it can remove that and improve their lives and everyone around them greatly. It's the tool that can take kids out of really horrible home situations like my own and um, end up making a difference. And so I, I try to express that anyway. And yeah, I guess we can do a Q&A. Don't yeah, ask me anything about quantum mechanics because I don't want to. Yeah. I, yeah, keep your quantum mechanics questions Keep your questions time to relativity yourself, questions. Weirdo. It's not that I don't like them. It's just that you've seen how my brain works. And if you introduce quantum mechanics to that, it's not going to be fun for anyone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to come to you. I'm going to hold the mic for you to make sure you actually ask a question. Mm -hmm. So please keep it brief. We want to get oh, lots nice. of questions answered. Yes. And, she's oh, and while you're doing that, um, I have a table back there of a lot of different handouts and stuff. Um, please take things. If you've got kids here, I've got vinyl stickers. I've got these, um, they're like little cardboard models of New Horizons, which is what we took that Pluto picture with. And they can make little crafts. I have so many. I have collectible lithographs. Please take them, please. Um, I have, those are all in my trunk. So, um, please, oh, and of course these. Um, and, oh, and just one last thing about Artemis. If you go on NASA, just Google NASA Artemis Kids, literally just that, you can go on there. They've got printable coloring books and activity pages, and you can kind of go through with your kids. There's videos on there, all kinds of stuff. Um, really great for when you're at home and you're trying to make them do something else. Um, and then I am now certified, but I can, um, it's on the website now. You can certify them in Artemis and they can put it in their room. It's official from NASA. Now that you've been here, you can do it too. So anyway, I really, uh, I, I really want to emphasize that because we put a lot of work into that stuff and I really want some kids to enjoy it. So anyway. Okay. First question. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh, what you said that there was an earth, like, I think it was a moon, what does Earth, early Earth-like mean to you? What makes it like an early Earth? Okay. So in this instance, we're talking about uh, traces of liquid water. We're talking about a perfect environment to create life, meaning um, sunlight, a food source, um, and, and a type of atmosphere that can uh, protect it from UV light. So it's kind of just like, it's like the, it's like the perfect situation for incubating and starting life. Now, the question is, has anything hit it or, or come across its path to spark it like it did here? That's the question. I mean, obviously, that is a literal question. I have no idea. So, um, but we're sending a probe there very, very soon to look at it and to do some chemical composition tests to see what's going on. Because life as we know it, like the rules that we play by may not be applicable anywhere else. Which is kind of cool to think about. You know, we're carbon-based life forms. I know this is a tangent. I told you it was going to happen. We're carbon-based life forms. But what if there are life forms out there that are based on a completely different element? And so they need different things to live and survive. And uh, if, if you have nerdy kids like I do, it's cool for them to have a concept and, like, draw an alien and do all kinds of stuff. I don't make my kid do any of that because she's kind of like, oh, space, so boring. But... Um, <laughs> But uh, she's people. She hates the TV stuff too. She thinks it's so boring. But um, you know, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's that's what that means. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question. Um, I've read a couple articles that suggested there is actually ice water on the moon <laughs> in the southern portion. Is that uh, possible? <laughs> is that what's going on there? Really? It's 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 chemically it's ice, but it's and it's 
it's ice mixed with the type of sediment of um, basically volcanic ash that's on the moon. It's kind of all compressed together. Um, and there is something to that, obviously I don't know everything, but there is a reason why they don't turn that into liquid water and I don't, can't remember what it is, but it's something to do with the chemical composition. But yes, mm -hmm. and we need to send more people and things there to check it out. Because, you know, like I said, it's been a really long time. And China just sent someone or people there, but we're still waiting on that, so. Okay, next question. Uh, can you explain the, um, what qualifies Pluto as a planet or not as a planet? Uh-oh, uh-oh, it's getting real. <laughs> okay, like, I may only be five foot, but I'm scrappy, so don't mess with me. And I brought my best friend and she's, she'll get you. She's done it before. Uh, not really. Um, okay. So a brief explanation about Pluto is we have qualifications for things that make them planets, whether it be their orbit around the sun, um, whether it be directions that they're tilted, all kinds of things. But the very simplistic answer is one, Pluto doesn't follow any of those rules of, other the, pla of the planets. Its orbit crosses completely through other planets. But there are so many things that are the size of Pluto or bigger out by where Pluto is that we don't count as a planet. So um, and it's kind of like, so that's why we call it a dwarf planet is because there's so many other ones out there. And I know that everybody is very nostalgically attached to Pluto. I, I get it. No, you don't understand. I did a New Horizons thing and people were keyboard warrioring me for weeks about that. And I'm like, I'm not invested enough in this. Like, if you want it to be a planet, make it a planet. It's really not, I've got other stuff to worry about, you know? But, um, but that's, I mean, for me, that's the bigger part of it. It's not even about the orbit and everything else, because we could make exceptions. But it's just about the fact that there's a bunch of them out there, hundreds, that we don't say are planets. And this one, it's just like, oh, we love Pluto. It's so cute. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> like, it's, you know, I don't Okay, so don't bully Danielle later about Pluto or else I'll be number three scrapping I'll just, this, okay? I'll just walk away. I can't. Okay, next question. Uh, yeah, I'm from Kansas and a Kansan discovered Pluto, so we're still pissed about that. <laughs> I do have the question about Orion, uh, about Orion not the, the capsule that sure. NASA's creating. Why do we need one? Why is Elon Musk creating one and NASA creating one? And what's the difference and what's their... Is, why they, why yeah. does Elon Musk do anything he does? Because he wants to. No, I mean, I think his view as a whole is that the more competition there is in an industry, the better the technology that comes from it is, right? Because if you're up against somebody and there's a race, just like our space race in the 60s and 70s, that kind of atmosphere generated a lot of excitement and things that led to better technology than we might not have had socially um, with that. So. Um, I think that he feels, no, I know that he feels, uh, that he is, uh, that he can streamline things. I don't want to say better, but, um, better, um, that he can, <laughs> he can make things, uh, more simple and more streamlined. He's been putting Tesla doors on everything because he can, you know, he's that person. But, you know, I, and everything I say, I love Elon and I, I I am so thankful that people like him exist in this world because he thinks of things on a completely different plane than most people. And I know that he's got some personal stuff or whatever, but um, that Falcon 9 dual landing, if you guys haven't seen it, look, up, look it up on YouTube, right, where they, it was the first time that they ever sent something up and landed it completely back down to be reusable. I mean, that as itself is amazing. So, and it's going to save us a ton of money. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy that he's doing it. I think he thinks he can do it better or um, his team can do uh, different things. And that's the great thing is from now on, um, combining the two, NASA, SpaceX, plus uh, institutions like MIT and Harvard, coming together, um, you know, I think it'd be great. Um, that's how we got Hubble. You know, each of the pieces of Hubble 
um, I have it on me, but each of the uh, parts of Hubble are from a different institution completely, and they put them all together to get something great. So, you know, I'm happy he's doing it. We'll see. With him, you really don't know. I, you really don't know. So, any more? Okay, next question. There's probably not an answer to my question, but I was watching something on television about the universe, and the guy's talking about the speed light is the ultimate speed limit. They said the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. So if you got on a spaceship at the speed of light, the farther you went, the farther you'd have to go before you got to the edge of the universe. If you ever got there, how would you know where you were? Good luck with that one, Danielle. Yeah. Who else has a question? Okay. Next, next question. Sorry, Jim. No, I, not to be disrespectful, that's I, not my field. Quantum is not my field, though. I'm not going anywhere at the speed of light. Atomically, not great for human bodies. So, you know, I don't know. But more cartoons cool if you want TV. to, go for it. Right, yeah. Next question. Okay. Uh, space junk. What, what is going to be done? I understand that's a growing problem um, mm -hmm. as we put more stuff out there. Everything whizzing around is basically a high-speed bullets. Uh, how are we going to keep that under control? Mm -hmm. There's so many different... I know that they're doing kind of... How NASA gets a lot of things done is they have competitions. They turn everything into inventing competitions um, to kind of source ideas from the public. And I know that they had one. I don't know the result of it was. But to come up with what we do. So every time we send up satellites which include things for your phones includes technology uh, your gps technology that stuff gets decommissioned and it just kind of hangs out up there and it's like he said it's moving really quickly so if it hits something that like a spacecraft that we send up there good luck it's it's worse than a bullet i mean it would completely annihilate things so i think they're trying to basically once they streamline being able to get to the moon a lot better they're going to be able to have crews that go up there and clean up sections of it um i would assume or kind of collect it and bring it down because i know a lot of it does eventually fall back in the atmosphere but you don't know when when that's going to happen um but that's kind of the distressing thing for me it's like our oceans are bad but space is worse like uh, proportionally, it's much worse. We've just got a bunch of stuff up there. Um, so I, I hope that they streamline and they figure out a way to kind of collect it and it just send it back down and knock it back down so it can burn up. Um, I hope, yeah. Okay, we have time for one last question. Okay. We, we were talking before this started about oh. uh, the different types of jobs at NASA and I was wanting to know if you could tell us some of the most unusual jobs yeah. That NASA has for people. Okay, so I go to NASA JPL or other NASA headquarters for different things for press or whatever um, several times a year. And so in every morning, I'm in teleconferences with NASA engineers or people that work at NASA because they can, as a, my background is in physics, so they can kind of tell me what they're doing and my job is to figure out how to translate that into something that makes sense for the public. Um, so in doing that, I've met so many really cool people. Um, there, an example that comes to mind, um, at NASA JPL, they have music composers. And their job, not only to do stuff for us for our presentations, their job is to work on um, the sound of aircraft. So they have a whole house, like a fake house, in the middle of JPL, and the people that work there or even random people from public can come and sit down and they simulate what that spacecraft would sound like at different altitudes, and then you have a little thing and you say how much it bothers you if you were to live there, right? Because in California especially, we've got some issues, uh, speaking of Elon, of things that kind of terrify people because not everybody sits and looks at the schedule of different spacecraft, but we're also talking about um, you know, really fast aircraft and other things that they'll develop. So. Um, their background is in musical composition. Some of them are very um, accomplished composers of like classical music and stuff, but now that's what they do. Um, they work on that kind of stuff. We've got uh, people that do the science of trash, trying to simulate um, human waste and, and um, everything else that's up on the space station and how we can get rid of it in a, a better way. Because even if something works, trying to make it better is always great. You know? So, um, that's really neat. The food science people, they've got amazing, 
you know, award-winning chefs that work on their meals for the space station because they're all freeze-dried in little packets and then they hook them up to hot water and it goes in there and then it kind of reanimates the food. Um, and you can go there and try their food and rate it for them and all that stuff. Because, you know, they're all scientists at heart. So um, doing that, I'm trying to think if there's other, like, crazy. There's all kinds. I mean, literally anything you can think of. And that's why when I talk to kids, and if you've got kids that are not math and science inclined, but they love NASA, please, on my behalf, tell them you can do it. Because NASA takes any and everybody. And their goals are so big that they can fit all different kinds of people. And when you go there, it's like a college campus because you never know who or what you're going to run into. And they're some of the best people in their fields, but they're all kinds of things. Um, you know, and I really want kids to know that because I feel like, like I said about not gatekeeping science and space innovation, you know, I don't want any kid to think, oh, I'm not good at math because I was not. I'm not good at math. I can't do well, literally anything, because, you know, kids, kids can do anything, and you can be accepted anywhere in NASA, and I hope you are, so. <laughs> All right, Danielle, thank you so much. Let's give her a big round of applause. All right, and... Danielle's table will be at the back if you guys want to grab all your goodies a little bit later on. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all this great information. We are definitely going to be calling you back. What? Sarah's got a thing. Sarah's going to do a thing. Sarah, please come do a thing. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Oasins. So um, we need to make buttons and... We didn't have any ideas, so we thought we would take it to the community, and we need buttons.